Welcome to Providence Church. It is great to be with you this morning. I'm Sherry. This is my husband, Mike. Uh, for those of you joining us via live stream, welcome. It is great to be with you this morning. For those of you here in person and newer to Prov, we encourage you on your way out to visit our Connection Center, and you'll get to learn some things about us. Fill out a Connect card, and we can get to know you. So some of the things we'd love you to do is uh, come to our newcomer luncheon that's going to be Sunday, July 10th, after the second service. Uh, we'd love for you to register for that at ProvidenceWC.org. Also, on our website and our Prov Life app, you can find out about all the events coming up and ways to give. Uh, some of the events, just to give you a heads up for next week, are Saturday is our budget boot camp. Saturday, June 11th, here at Prov, it's going to be downstairs at 9 a.m. If you want to learn some stuff about budgeting and finance, that's a great thing to attend. For our Prov kids' families, we're going to have pizza in the park. How fun is that? Pizza and park, they go so great together. Saturday, June 11th at 5 p.m. at Shadyside Park. Again, find information on our website or our app. And then a marriage workshop next Sunday, June 12th at both services, 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Also register for that, ProvidenceWC.org. Okay, Mike stands up here with me this morning to talk to us about one of our strategic partners, Mission Senegal. So I'm going to turn it over to you, honey. Thank you, Sherry. I appreciate that. I am absolutely pumped to be able to give this announcement because this ministry is near and dear to my heart. So our relationship with the remote village of Gonin, which for those of you who don't know, is in the 1040 window in West Africa in the country of Senegal. This relationship has really transformed over the last decade and a half. Yeah, a decade and a half. That's how long we've been engaged in relationship there. I want to tell you one story because stories are the kind of thing where you, you really remember. One inspiring story resulting from our relationship with the village of Gonin and Mission Senegal. And it starts out with a man named Saliu Kama. And that's him right there. Just hold that picture up there because I think a picture is worth a thousand words. Let me tell you about Saliu and how his life has been transformed as a result of this ministry. 17 years ago when we first started going to the village of Gonin, his father, Paul Kama, and there's a picture of him right there, that's his father, gave his life to Christ. That's significant because this is a primarily Muslim village. So he gave his life to, to Christ, received the Lord, and he began to grow in his relationship with Jesus. Not only that, but he encouraged his kids, the Kama kids, to get involved with the local ministry there, which is the kids' club, which comes into the village, and they have Bible stories and kids' club. You can see pictures of that. And all of his children went to the kids' club. And guess who was there? Sali Ukama, when he was a young boy. And Sali Ukama, through that kids' club, began a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's impact, guys. <laughs> I know. So let's, like, let's bring you forward now. So now what is Sali Ukama doing? What's he doing? He's following Jesus, number one. Number two, he is totally involved with the local church. There's a local church there in the village. And number three, he's working on economic stability within the village. Let me kind of bring this together and tell you what this looks like. Through the opportunity that Mission Senegal's guided project of Empower Gonin, you guys maybe have heard that. It's called Empower Gonin here. Sala Yu was given the chance to stay in the village and not have to leave. How? Because he had the opportunity to do some microfinancing, to get involved with the agricultural project, and he was really able to um, stay in the, in the village. I want to speak a little bit specifically about that, okay? So here's, some, here's a picture of the, of the agricultural project. Hopefully you can see that. Okay, this is what Sala Yu is doing. Salyu is working on the project. He's growing crops. He's learning the basics of giving, saving, planning, and providing for his family. He believes in time 
he will be able to do even more for his community and extend the good news of Jesus Christ to other villages. That's his heart now. Oh, boy. Now he is a grown man. I know. Clack, right? It's really, really inspiring. All right. That's just one story. That's just one story of the impact that Mission Senegal's and Paragonian Project, which, by the way, is directed by Jules Caho, who is a member of this church from Senegal. So that's just one story that the project ha has had in helping to create economic and ministry stability and move the village toward really independence fiscally. All right, that's the model. It is re reproducible, and our goal is to see that reproduced into other villages. If this is your first time hearing about this, and Power Gooning, Mission Senegal, or not, I hope your heart's tugged a little bit, because this is really exciting work. We invite you to do two things. You can act on this. One, you can talk to one of the Mission Senegal committee members. Here they are right here. People in our church that are on the Mission Senegal committee, well, well engaged in the ministry, talk to one of us. Number two, if you want to hear more stories like you just heard, Come, join us for a night in Gooning, June 25th. It's coming up. June 25th, 6 p.m., right here. If you guys came in, you noticed all the beautiful Senegalese pictures. Please take a minute to walk down the hallway and look at them. And you can use the, the QR code, and you can make your reservation to come to, the, come to our night in Gooning, June 25th. I encourage you all to come. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Sherry. Um, and we're so glad that you're here. We're celebrating the work that Jesus is doing in Senegal. Um, you'll see behind me this baptismal. We're, we're celebrating baptisms this Sunday. Um, go ahead. Give a round of applause. Um, we are also celebrating this Sunday is Pentecost. Uh, Pentecost means 50. Uh, this is the celebration of the giving of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, and as you may know or may not know, the reason that uh, many were gathered in Jerusalem uh, for Pentecost is it was the Jewish uh, festival or feast of weeks called Shavuot. Uh, and they were gathered there. Uh, normally Jews, that's, this is a celebration of the harvest. Normally they would bring two loaves of leavened bread. Uh, and they would celebrate the uh, five books of Moses, which were thought to have also occurred on Shavuot. And uh, they read the book of Ruth, which is a lot, has to do with the harvest as well. So we are celebrating so much this morning, baptisms, uh, Pentecost, Shavuot. And I'll invite you to stand as we worship. And we're celebrating you with us. So maybe turn to someone that you don't know, greet them and say, uh, let's celebrate this morning.
Before we keep singing, I'd love to read out of uh, Ruth 1. This is um, verse 16 through 18. It says, But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord do, uh, do so to me. And more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when, and when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Amen.
hey, I'm not sure what your week has been like, but I want to give you just a sacred space for the next 30 seconds for you to just offer your own presence to the Lord, just telling him, here I am. Or maybe you you just want to lift up your heart and say, I'm just struggling being present today. Or maybe you're very present today. You're like, Lord, I'm with you. Here we are. But just your own prayer for the next, quietly in your own heart, for the next couple moments. Lord, I just want to thank you, Father. You're a good Father, and you have the capacity to hear every prayer that was just ushered from our souls as if it was just me and you. I don't know how you do that, (laughs) but we're so thankful that you're that personal, that it was just like it was me with you and you with me. And so, Lord, I do pray for each and every individual that's here today that they would each have an encounter with you that is special, that a encounter that they need. And maybe it's a, an encouragement from you. Maybe it's a rebuke and a correction because you love to give them life. Maybe it's just a, just a whisper, whatever it is, Lord. We just pray you have your way with each and every one of us today. We pray this in the faithful name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Uh, hey, actually, you're going to have a seat, and I'm going to ask a couple people to stand up, but you can have a seat. Hey, if you are actually here today, uh, and you know someone that is being baptized, or you're here to celebrate someone that is being baptized, would you mind just standing up? We want to welcome you and thank you to hear. Just stand up if you know someone being baptized. That's awesome. Thank you, guys. It's great to see you guys. Hey, hey, I give you guys permission. Uh, when the person that you love is being baptized, you can have a seat. You can have a seat. I'm not going to make you stand the whole thing. It's being baptized, and they come up. We're going to say, we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we're going to put them under the water and bring them up. You can share. A little practice. Like, baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, exactly. Exactly. It's a worthy cheer. It's a holy cheer. It's a sacred cheer. I love it. All right, so just to, uh, before they come up and share, um, which we can all pray for them, it takes a lot of courage to stand up in front of people and share. So we do. We thank you for these guys who are going to be sharing, and they would be at ease, and, and, um, and then they're going to get baptized in this, in this thing back here behind me. Let me just set the tone. For those of you who have not been with our family the last couple months, we are in the book of Matthew. So there's four Gospels written about the life of of Matthew. Matthew, written about Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're in Matthew. And since we're doing baptisms, I'm going to cheat and go to the very end of the letter that Matthew was writing, the very last verses that he was writing, and just to set the context for, uh, for our baptisms today. The very, very end of Matthew, uh, this is between the time that Jesus resurrected. He resurrected from the dead, amen, right? It's awesome. And then he ascended into heaven. That was different. He ascended in bodily form up into heaven. And there was a time period between his resurrection and and his ascension. That was about, the. anybody know how many days? It's about 40 days. So after Jesus resurrected, he wandered around for 40 days, appearing to people and encouraging them in their faith. You know what I love about the Lord? He stirs up our faith. How many of us have doubts? We all do. But Jesus is a champion of our doubt. And he comes and he stirs up our faith. And so between his resurrection and his ascension, he's teaching. These are some of the last words he gave to his disciples before he ascended. That's where we are, okay? So Matthew 28, verse 16 says this. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Now, I love this. This Jesus died in Jerusalem, which is the southern part of Israel. But he says, hey, guys, I want you to meet me up in Galilee, which is 
all the way the, to the northern part. That's a long trek. I would be like, can we just do it here in Jerusalem? Why do you want me to hike all the way back to Galilee to meet you? You know what I think Jesus was doing? My opinion. Here's my opinion. I think Jesus wanted them to go from Jerusalem all the way back to Galilee so they can remember all the ways that he met them and loved them and taught them. You know how you go to a place and you remember, oh, I remember what happened there. Oh, yeah. Oh, remember Jesus did that? Oh, yeah. Oh, remember when we were there? And I think when they were going back, they were remembering the faithfulness of God all the way till they got back. And then when they get back to Galilee, it says, when they saw him, Jesus showed up. When they saw him, here's what they did. They worshiped him. Now listen, I think that was quite a worship time. Can you imagine they saw Jesus die? The humiliation of what he went through. Now they're with him. Now they walk all the way and they remember his faithfulness in all our times, their times with him. And then he's there. I mean, can you imagine that worship service? I mean, I think they were fired up. I think we get fired up for a lot of things. We get fired up for football games and lacrosse games. We get fired up when our kids, but that moment, they were fired up. That's why I think it's okay for us to come sometimes and get a little fired up in our worship. It's our king has resurrected, right? And he shows up to them. And it says they worshiped him, but here's the, here's, here's the reality of being human, but some doubted. Isn't that true? We worship, and yet there's some doubt there. Then Jesus came and said to them, these are the last words. Look, I'm reading the end of the book of Matthew. It's read. These are the last words that Matthew writes in his gospel. Right here, red letters. That's what I'm reading. He says this to them. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. In other words, Jesus was saying, the humiliation is over. My death is over. I've conquered death. I've conquered sin. I have authority over it, right? It's quite a moment. And they're like, yes, right? They're like, authority. Like, he's not just talking about authority. He demonstrated his authority, and he's alive, and he's there. And in his authority, we know he's coming back. And we know that Jesus Christ will reign. And we know that Jesus Christ will make all things right. And we know that every knee and every, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord. Huh? All right. I don't know. I'm pretty fired up about that. You're just looking at me. So all authority has been given to me. And then here's what Jesus does with his authority. He could do anything, but here's what he does. At that moment, he could just be like, and eh, and eh. But here's what he says. He says... Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. So he says to these 11 people, and there were probably more there. I, I think there were probably more like 70. And he says to these like 120 people, 70 people, but especially the 11, he said, I want you to go change the world. And because they believed that and walked in that, 2,000 years later, we're showing, here we are talking about Senegal. Because it's about the nations. It's about serving. And he says, I want you to go and make disciples. People think that the middle of this passage is all about going. No, it, it's the, the, the centrality of that command, go and make disciples. It's that term, go make disciples. In other words, as you're going and living life, in whatever you do, if you're a mom, make disciples. If you're, if you're a painter, Make disciples. If you're a coach, make disciples. If you're in your neighborhood, make disciples. The command there is, guys, as you're going because of my authority and because of my death and burial and resurrection, I'm commissioning all of you. Whom? Whom? Right? Right? Whom? Whom? Right? Jesus is saying, I'm commissioning all of you. As you live life to go make disciples. You know why I think the church gets bored? We're not making disciples. It's awesome to be able to pour your life into someone else's life as you're loving Jesus. Well, I don't know much. These guys didn't either. They just got done denying Jesus and hiding in an upper room. Go and make disciples, family. Your relationship will get quite dynamic when you're making disciples because you'll be like, Lord, how do I do this? And he'll help you. Go and make disciples. All through and therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. And here it is, part of making disciples, baptizing them 
in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I love this part, and Jesus says, you think I'm leaving, but I'm leaving to send the Holy Spirit. And surely I will be with you to the very end of the age. So why do we have this thing? Some people say, well, can you just sprinkle? Just put a little water. Yes. We've done that when we've gone to China. We didn't have pools. We sprinkled. But why do we say, you know, in a moment we're going to say, we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We put them under the water. Why do we put them under the water? Put them under the water because of this. Jesus lived the life we were supposed to live. Here's the deal, though. He included us in his life. I want you to think about that. Jesus lived the life you were supposed to live, and then he said, you're in my life. Jesus died the death we were supposed to die for sin. And you know what he says to you? You're in my death. Isn't that awesome? Jesus did what we couldn't do. Jesus resurrected life. And then he says to each one of us, you are in my resurrection. And Jesus ascended. It's like he wrapped his glorious body around you and pulled you into the beauty of the relationship that exists and has always existed between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The magnanimous love of that you are pulled into through the deity and humanity of Jesus right up. Why do we put people under? Because you are in union with Jesus' death under. Does that make sense? And thank God we don't hold you under. Because three days later, he what? He resurrected. You're in his resurrection. So we lift you up out of the water, reminding you that you are in union and communion with the resurrection of Jesus. Out of the water, we, <laughs> right? we clap because it is awesome. It is awesome. And these guys and these 11 people, how did they change the world? I mean, let's just face it. One of the evidences, one of the greatest evidences to me that Jesus Christ did resurrect from the dead is that these 11 men and many women, but these 11 men in particular, died some awful deaths for Jesus. Bartholomew was flayed alive. John was boiled in oil and then banished to Patmos. He didn't die. Matthew was beaten with clubs. Thomas went to East India and was lanced with a spear. Peter was crucified upside down. Would you like to follow Jesus? He'll give you life. But it doesn't mean we won't suffer. It doesn't mean that. And one of the testimonies are these men's and women. Throughout history, consistent testimony of suffering of these believers is one of the greatest evidences for the tangibility and authenticity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Pentecost started 2,000 years ago. We are a church still alive, worshiping Jesus because of that event happened. And Jesus said, I am with you. So, let's welcome these guys as they give their testimonies. And uh, the first one is going to be Sarah. So Sarah, I want to invite you to join me here. Give Sarah a hand. I can't follow Phil with that kind of passion. Yes, you can. Try. You're fine. You're you, Sarah. <laughs> Dude. All right, so thanks, Phil. Um, I want to start by talking about really just how I did not grow up with God in my home. But at a young age, I felt God's presence over me. I truly knew that God was present over my life when I met my husband, who rescued me from more than what he even realizes to this day. Over the last 14 years of marriage, we've been blessed with three really awesome kids. And during these years of parenting, I thought I was always in control like many of us do. I didn't need help. I didn't need guidance because I had it. I felt a need to protect my kids from things that pained me as a kid, and I had to keep them away from toxic family members, and in that process, I felt even more alone, even though my life was filled with so much joy. Being that I never really had experience in church, I never understood how to reach God like other people could. I thought maybe God was just for some other people, but maybe just not for me. 
I lacked a true spiritual hunger, mostly because I just felt super unworthy of his grace and because I didn't even know how to find him. With so much going on in the world the last few years, I was beginning to feel a lot of anger, worry, and fear in my role as a mother, as a lot of us have. My husband and I were super lost on decisions for our kids and all of this chaos. My anxiety was growing every day. Then any new development or piece of information got released, and I really didn't like how angry it was making me feel and how anxious as well. So on New Year's Day, just this past year, I was driving alone in my car when all of these feelings of confusion and worry and fear took hold of me as I was thinking about my kids. Yeah. I realized, for once, I needed his help. And so I said, Lord, help me. I felt like a lost child reaching out to a father that I never knew. So that moment was really important to me because I didn't have a father. I said, how do I protect my kids from the world and how do I keep them well in such a messed up place yeah. that we all have to be here for? And I asked God to help me. And I said, please help me, guide me, and use me however you need me in this life, Lord. I commit myself to you. I can't keep walking through life without you. And God delivered. So the following day, I was told from my cousin about a Christian conference streaming live from Atlanta, Georgia. So for the first time, I gave my undivided attention to God. In Pastor Ben Stewart's sermon that afternoon, he said, Many of you are not experiencing God in your life because the word of life is being choked by the worries of life. Amen, right? Distraction and anxiety will derail you from your destiny. And wow, was he talking to me. I realized in that moment, wow, I'm so distracted from you, God. I'm sorry. So after an hour of me, like, pondering all of that, <laughs> I get an email from an online fellowship for teachers that I had considered doing in the past, but, of course, I was too distracted to commit to. They're beginning a Bible study for the new year, so fresh off Ben Stewart's sermon and words on <laughs> distraction, I said, all right, amen, Lord, here I go. I clicked on the Bible readings, and I signed up, and God really wanted to talk to me that day. That day's devotion said this, distractions, they're probably the most universal hindrance to prayer. Demonize distractions. View anything seeking to draw you away from prayer as your enemy. You have an enemy that doesn't want you praying, right? So that word again, distraction, I'm like, wow, twice, Whew, okay. So later that night, I'm reading to my daughter, my daughter Jules, who's seven, and for Christmas, she got a book series on women of the Old Testament, so okay, I'm reading her the book, and then... There's a devotion for the day, um, and it said, when we are still, without anything there to distract us, whoo, okay, it gives us a chance to hear what God wants to tell us. All right, Lord, distraction, I heard you, okay? So there it is, you know, and um, the funny thing is, I didn't realize it till later when I looked through it, I was actually on the wrong devotion for the day, I, could, I, I like, you know, so I was like, all right, Lord, I hear you, okay? So I wasn't even supposed to be on that day, okay. Sometimes my mistakes don't work out that cool, but... Um, before going to bed that night, I told God, I realized he's answering my plea for help. He was telling me that I'm distracted from him, and I needed to find a church to go to. All right? So I did a quick Google search on Christian churches near my home, and of course, here's where I am, right? Woo, amen. So <laughs> I click on Providence's core values, and they are. Jesus is the focus. Yeah. We are in a relationship with God through the person and life of Jesus. We refuse. Anybody know the word? be distracted <laughs> from anything that takes our eyes off Jesus. So I said, God, okay, just come in booming, right? So on that Sunday, on January 9th this year, we came to our first service here at Prov. We've hardly missed a Sunday. I kind of scheduled my life now around church. I'm like, sorry, I'm one of those church people now. Can't go. <laughs> <We've>, <laughs> the Holy Spirit runs through our family, and uh, we talk to God daily. Amen. We've had prayers answered, and direction provided when we seek it. Uh, we are walking closer with Jesus every single day of our lives, never looking back. We're no longer distracted, right? And we focus on God's glory every single day. And I'm not unsatisfied anymore, but now I hunger and thirst for the Lord like I should have Amen. from the start. That's good. Amen. Yes, my That's life awesome. has been reborn. When I asked for help that day, I was looking for a quick, do this, Sarah. And what he gave me was Jesus. Yeah. So 
Psalm 56 is really important to me. It felt like it was fitting for today. Verse 12 through 13. God, I must keep my promises to you. I will give you my offerings to thank you because you've kept me from being defeated. So I will walk with God in light among the living. Lord, I thank you for hearing us when we cry out to you and for loving us endlessly. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Alone. This is the best word I could use to sum up my eighth grade year. I was reco- recovering from a terrible concussion that took me out of school for five months, basketball for a year, and most social events. I remember seeing all my friends post about the fun things they were up to while I was going to therapy session after therapy session for a head injury that at this point felt impossible to heal from. God felt so distant. I grew up in a Christian household, so I knew who God was and what he did for everyone. But it wasn't until about four months into my recovery that I really knew God. I remember one night I was in my room after a really hard conversation with my doctor. And I just remember saying, God, I don't know where you are, but I can't do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. I was just lying on my floor, sat up, picked up my Bible, turned to a random page, and it read Philippians 4. I skimmed over this chapter and found my eyes focused on Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I read that verse and started sobbing because I knew he saw me, saw me in my pain, alone, and suffering. In that moment, I knew I no longer could try to act like I had everything under control because I didn't. I handed my life over to him knowing he was the only way out of suffering. My faith has My faith has grown throughout the past couple of years as I attend an amazing Christian school that is like a family to me. I have teachers who are mentors in Christ to me and friends who only help to strengthen my faith walk. I've seen God move in my life, and I wouldn't trade my experience in eighth grade for anything because it's what started my walk with Christ. Hi, church. Good, good, good. Stand up. I'm Dave. Yeah, come over here. Right here. Right there. That's perfect. There we go. <laughs> so, um, my story starts, I guess, um, where I was raised in a family with a, a slight Catholic background, and I had no belief in God. And because of this, it kind of like, um, it kind of allowed me to dismiss God because of like the way that I was raised in like Catholic school and then because it didn't really work out for me then it, I kind of just dismissed the idea and um, I quickly turned to philosophy and like science worldview. Um, I was an atheist and um, I would often argue with believers um, and try and convince them that like my logic or my way of thinking was better and I've I always been like a rebellious kid. Um, some called me a young savage. <laughs> uh, I did pretty much whatever I wanted to and always got into a lot of trouble, uh, whether it was like big things or just like little things, getting yelled at by the teacher, stuff like that. I surrounded myself with people that were a very bad influence on me. Uh, I did a bunch of stuff like um, fight, steal, sneak out, do drugs, lie. Uh, hurt people close to me, take advantage of people, and pretty much uh, anything that I thought was like good for me. Uh, I kind of was just living uh, selfishly, but little did I know, like I didn't realize at the time. I just thought that we were all supposed to live for ourselves in like a selfish way, I guess. Um, little did I know these things were hurting me and my life a lot and hurting the people around me. Um, I was truly a slave to these things and a slave to sin. And then one day, um, I went to Young Life, just this one time, and uh, I met a girl who was very lovely. At the time, she was pretty opposite to me, but something about that was so cool. Um, I didn't know any other kid my age like her, um, and it just grew like that the more I got to know her. And this was my first experience of, like, God showing through a person. 
but mm -hmm. I didn't really realize it. Uh, soon after, my mother was saved, and I saw it in her, too. And that definitely had a big impact on me as well. But I was still spiraling in the wrong direction. Uh, things in my life weren't good or healthy. Um, and then I hit an all-time low when my best friend took his life. And I realized something needed to change. And I realized the way that I was living just wasn't working. Um, everything... I tried to fulfill myself, just couldn't fulfill me. And, and so I prayed to God, and, and um, I, I kind of, this battle grew inside me um, for good and evil. And, like, a part of me just wanted to be good and everything to be okay, and then another part of me just kept going down the wrong direction. And then one day I went to school, and my friend, my friend came up to me, and he told me about God in a way that I've just never heard before. And uh, my eyes were open, and um, the battle for good and evil just grew stronger within me because now I was just getting pulled stronger in this direction. And then, um, then I went to work, and a coworker came up to me out of nowhere and spoke to me about internal struggle and choosing a path in life. And... And like, he's like, you're at an age where you're starting your life and you have to decide like where you're going to go and you have to decide what you're going to do, who you're going to be. And like little did he know like how much that like spoke to me at the time. Um, and it just meant so much. And then I went home and I like, had this weird feeling in my stomach. And my, I walked in the door and my mom, she, she said to me something like, she was like, I can just tell that... Um, you you have this battle inside you like I can just tell like there's this fight going on over your soul for good and evil and she's like God's fighting for you like he's working in you like that's God and 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 then I didn't know what to do I, I called the girl from Young Life uh, <laughs> <laughs> the lovely ones sh uh, she'll come up and speak after me actually um, and I told her everything that was happening and she's like She's like, sometimes I wonder if you just always liked me because you saw God through me. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of that, at that moment, I realized that God wasn't just fighting for me now, but he was fighting for me my whole life. He was yes. fighting for me two years ago when I met that girl at Young Life. He was fighting for me. Like, ever since I was a little kid, I just wanted that goodness, and that could only be filled up by God. And... Um, that night I prayed, I gave my life to Jesus, I surrendered, and I just saw him so clearly that night. My life was never the same again, and I'm no longer a slave to sin, but I'm still a savage, but in a good way, <laughs> not a bad way. Amen. That was awesome, Jamie. That is definitely the word savage has been used from <laughs> the word. Right. Sophie. Uh, <laughs> you can stand right up close to that. Okay. Take it. I know. It's wild, isn't it? Oh, my God. Who's next? Okay. Hello. <laughs> my name is Sophia Vendetti Spar. Um, I was raised Catholic, but barely attended church. Um, my family and I were believers of God, but there was, like, no depth to it. I always felt him with me, but I never knew what it meant to learn, love, and follow God. I grew up with separated parents. I'm a triplet, and I'm one of nine kids, so I, always, so I was used to always feeling overlooked, misunderstood, or even uncared for. Um, these false beliefs seemed so true, and it made me feel purposeless. I began to dislike my life. I began to feel unworthy. <laughs> unworthy of giving and receiving love. I was angry, sad, unsensitive, and super anxious. Um, <laughs> um, this then led me to start seeking validation through things like people and Instagram likes <laughs> and social media. I acted a certain way and desired certain things in hopes to res receive some form of validation that would make me feel better about myself. When I was a freshman, a senior asked me and my sisters to go to Young Life. <laughs> um, 
This was so cool to me. I was mainly excited about hanging out with the seniors since I cared so much about my social status and what people thought of me more than the idea of going to an actual Young Life in that event. Oh, you know I got you. Thank you. Um, uh, 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 um, and what people thought of me more than the idea of going to the event. As I continued going to Young Life, I became closer with the leaders who loved me so well and accepted me just as I was, and I didn't have to be someone I wasn't. There was someone who, oh wait, there, oh, there was someone who I wanted to be like, loving, genuine, welcoming, compassionate, and constantly themselves no matter what environment they were in. At Young Life, I got to learn more about Jesus, about his life, his heart, how compassionate, caring, and accepting he was. And then at Young Life Camp in 2019, I accepted my Jesus, I, uh, yeah. I accepted Jesus into my life. I truly, truly found my identity in him, and I no longer live for anyone yeah. or care about what anyone thinks. God has freed me from insecurity, from feeling purposeless, and from my fear of loving and receiving life. Although it wasn't easy, and it is not easy at all, I know that ultimately God is where I find truth, freedom, and joy. The verse, Mark 14, 38, says, Keep watch and pray, so that you will not give in a temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. I want to say that again. Mark 14, verse 38. Keep watch and pray, so that you will not give in a temptation, for the... Uh, gosh, okay. For the spirit is willing, but the body is yes. weak. <laughs> um, this is what helped me make bold decisions in my life and brought me closer to the Lord and even guided others to the Lord. It was a good reminder that I really cannot do this life alone and that God is greater than the greatest thing in this world. Oh, that's for you. Give them one more hand, right? Didn't they do a great job? That. Hey, I, I just want to, before we baptize them, I just want to give an invitation to each of you. I listened to a mom talk about how she needed Jesus. I listened to young people in high school that are getting fired up because they needed Jesus. I listen to people that wondered if their life counted. I just wonder about you. Not anybody else. Have you, have you come to that place and you said, you know, Jesus, going to church isn't what gives me salvation or you. It's great. You need to come to church. Whether my parents believe, that doesn't do it. You know, whether I went through a sacrament or not doesn't do it. It's one thing. Is he yours? Have you personally said, Jesus, I trust you as my Savior? Have you done that? Do you believe he'll be there for you? That he's always been there for you? You can simply tell him. It might sound like something like this in your heart. Jesus, as I sit here and listen to these testimonies of what you've done, I trust you that you forgave me on the cross for all my sins. And this day, I give you my life. Come into my life. And you make me the person that you designed me to be. In the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you this, if that's your heart and that's the decision you're making, tell someone. If you came with someone to celebrate someone's baptism and that was your, tell the person, I want you to know that I want to follow Jesus like that too. So would you stand with us? We're going to worship. We're going to go get changed um, and get ready to dunk these guys. Hey Amen. That's so encouraging. The next song we're going to sing, I feel like is a perfect segue into that. A common theme I was hearing was goodness. God is good. And that he's constantly pursuing us. We're going to sing about that.
We rehearsed for a lot of things. This was not one of the things that we rehearsed for. I'm just gonna make sure. Hey, would you stand with us? We have one more song that we're gonna sing together. first lines of this song are, my life is yours and my hope is in you only. Pretty poignant for Baptism Sunday.
very fresh way, we all say, Lord, have your way with us and change our lives. Bless these wonderful individuals who were baptized today and their families. And um, we're just in all of you. Amen. Hey, one quick family matter. Can you guys have a quick seat? It's a praise. If you're visiting with us, just bear with me for 30 seconds. Um, so four years ago, we started this thing called uh, Expand the Table. And we were in this little area, and our church was growing, and the children's ministry, there was no room for the kids. And we have a community center called the West Side that meets here every day. And we're like, we have no room. And Lord, what do you want us to do? And we said, we think God wants us to build a little bit bigger space so we can worship together. There's room for the kids downstairs. We can run a community center here during the week. And um, so we'd like, if we're going to really do it the way we should do it, it'll be like $5 million. This is four years ago. And everyone we talked to, uh, as it relates to professionals, said, you'll never do it. And I just want to tell you guys, and this is amazing praise, God did a miracle. Everything is raised. Here's what's amazing. This is what we have left, $100,000 of the $5 million. $100,000. It's a miracle. There's no, and here's how it happened. Prayer, trusting God, your generosity, and saying, God, can you do it? So I just thought, you know, in a month, wouldn't it be great if we just all worked really hard together? Maybe just making a pledge, like a one-time pledge. Can we knock out $100,000 so we can finish the stuff with the bank? And do what we need to do. So we're going to try to do that in the next three weeks. Some of you might want to consider like a one-time gift. Maybe others, um, if you want it, like say, you know what? I'll make a pledge again for two years. You can do that. Here's how you do it. There's a QR code, a little QR code. You can check that out. Or you can go online under expand the table. And it will direct you on how to do it. But let's just pray as we have that we can finish well. And we're just about there. And it's a great praise. So Lord... You're in it all. You're in our finances. You're in all of it. We trust you with it. And Lord, we pray together that uh, you would help us finish this $100,000. We can complete it. And we just thank you for what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you. Have a great day. Blessings. Thank you.